Public Access Television is not responsible for program content. This program is produced by Anchored in Faith Gospel Church of Oxford, Iowa. Reverend Linda Hahn, Senior Pastor. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week, beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube. From Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa, this is Anchored in Faith. Turn to our look at the uh, the law in the New Testament, or the Christian's responsibility under the law. And we said that, uh, of course, Paul is the big spokesman for this in the New Testament. He has the most to say about the law in the Old Testament because uh, he had a very complete knowledge of it. So. You know, he has the most to say, and of course there are people that are, are teaching that Paul shouldn't even be read because 
you know, he was false and he wasn't one of the original 12 and, and all of that. And we've, we've already been through that, but um, Paul has the most to say about the Christian and the, New Test and, and the law in the New Testament. Now, we said that in Galatians 3.19, it said that the law was added because of transgressions. And Galatians 3.24 and 25 says that the law is a schoolmaster. Now, the purpose of the law was twofold. First of all, to wean the Israelites away from idolatry, which they learned in Egypt, and it was added because of transgressions. In other words, uh, God's telling his people, if you want to be my people, this is how you'll live. And so we've said before, you know, that there's the old saying, no harm, no foul. In other words, where there's no law, you can't break the law. If there's no law against something, you can't break it. And so before the law, there were things that were done that were not actually against the law. But see, even with the coming of the law, your, your salvation was still by faith because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's what the scripture said. His faith saved him. There was no law. See, the law hadn't been given to Abraham. It wouldn't be given for a long time. But because he believed God when he spoke to him, then it was counted as righteousness. And when you're righteous with God, you're saved. That's what salvation is, is when you're in a right standing with God. And so before the law was, Abraham was justified by his faith. Now, after the law was given, a faithful Israelite who was trying to obey the law, we all know, they didn't do it perfectly. We all said that. But if you were trying to faithfully keep the law, then your faith was what was saving you. See? Because in the Hebrew, the word faith is the same as the word faithfulness. So in other words, you showed your faith by your faithfulness, by your obedience to the dietary law, your obedience to the, the laws against marrying the, the foreigners, uh, the laws against usury, all those things that were given in the law that we've looked at, if you were practicing those, trying to live up to them, then you were living by your faith. The book of, I think it's Hezekiah, either Hezekiah or Habakkuk says the just shall live by his faith. Martin Luther heard that, read that, and it revolutionized his life. That's what saved him because he'd been trying to serve God as a priest and a monk and a professor at the university and he got to the place where he hated God. And he was, he was in confession one day. He told his confessor, his confessor said, remember, God is a God of love. He said, I hate God. He's a monster. You can't, you can't satisfy him. Everything I've done, he did everything. He fasted, he prayed, slept in an unheated cell as a monk. Joined, you know, joined the church. I mean, gave up his whatever life he would have had. And he read the verse, the just shall live by his faith. And that's what saved him. He realized that his works weren't going to do it. So even with the law, a faithful Israelite was still being justified by faith because he, he had faith that his sacrifice would cover his sin, that his obedience to the law would show his, his heart to God, that he was trying to to really serve God. Not all the Israelites were. We, we know all that. Some would go through the motions and so were the priests and all that. But there were faithful Israelites all through the Old Testament. And they were trying to serve God. So even under the law, 
you're still saved by your faith. When we come to the New Testament, what did Jesus do? Jesus said, well, he completed the law. He operated under the law. Remember, they all tried to trip him up. They all tried to find some part of the law that he had violated. Remember, oh, you, you eat with unwashed hands. Well, that's not even in the law. That's a tradition. See, they were making that part of the law. Uh, you eat with sinners. You eat with the, the Gentiles, see? Well, it doesn't say you can't do that, but the, you know, they had developed this idea that the Gentiles were unclean. Well, you know, you weren't supposed to marry them and all of that, but to just touch a Gentile in the marketplace isn't really a sin. It's not on the law. But they developed that, see? So that's why they'd wash because, well, I've been out in the marketplace. I might have touched, you know, a Roman or a, you know, uh, somebody, a dead body or somebody that touched a dead body or something. So they always washed. Well, see, that's not, that's not the law. So Jesus operated under the law until his death. And when he died, what did he say? It's finished. It is finished. What does that mean? Well, the law is completed because the whole law points to Jesus. We tried to show that. It all points to Jesus. It's not just a bunch of laws designed to trip up everybody, make ruin their fun, and 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 you know, Yahweh is Satan and all that jazz that we've looked at. But it all, in some way, points to Jesus. And when he died, he said, it's finished. So the law is completed. Sin is finished. If we can, if we can get a hold of it, and I, I ain't got a hold of it yet, but we don't have to sin. Now, that's just the way it is. And you don't hear that preached much, but uh, the old-time preachers used to preach that sin is finished. It... it doesn't have to have power over the Christian. So you don't hear that very much, but that's what he's saying. It's finished. Sin is finished. Everything, your healing, sickness is finished. All of it is wrapped up in the sacrifice of Christ. And when he said it's finished, it means it's finished. So uh, that's what he said about it. So the law is completed and... The Christian, well, what do we do? If you look at Paul, see, Paul had to deal with all kinds of people. He was in the ancient world. He was, a, you know, he was an Israelite in the Roman Empire uh, dealing with uh, all kinds of people with different religions. And when he ministered, when he would go, of course, he, he had a pattern, you know, he'd go to a town usually went to the synagogue first and tried to preach Christ there, and they'd kick him out, beat him up or whatever, run him out, and then he would go to the Gentiles and minister to them. If you're dealing with the Jews, then you're not going to get anywhere if you don't respect some of their customs. So when he would minister you know, to Israelites in a town, he would follow the law. In other words, to make people comfortable. See, he, he didn't go in and, you know, start kicking the doors down and saying everything is wrong. When he would go into a Gentile home, he understood that they were coming out of idolatry of some kind, and he he respected that. He understood that they didn't know what he knew. And so he, he was flexible. And I guess in our world, we have to be flexible. Now, I have friends that worship on Saturday. Tana has a friend who worships on Saturday. And uh, that's their conviction. Now, worshiping on Saturday is... Well, <clears throat> I've gotten to the place maybe we should be because Sunday, uh, well, 
Sunday's a pagan holiday. It's the sun god day is what it is. But I think the principle is one out of seven we need to worship. We need to come together. So, but I respect people. If that's their conviction, you know, I'm not going to bug them about it. They're only following part of the law. See, they're only part, one little part of the law is the Sabbath. And there's more than one Sabbath. We said that already. There's several different Sabbaths in the Old Testament. And so people that are worshiping on Saturday are, well, they're, they're following part of the law. Same with diet. If they don't eat pork, and pork's the big one, you know, but uh, there's a lot of things you wouldn't eat under the law, the dietary law. And so, I mean, I respect that. Uh, but, I mean, I think you can be saved and have a different conviction. Now, maybe I'm, you know, I'm wrong, but I think that we have to look at who we're worshiping more than how we're worshiping. I mean, like baptism, there's different kinds of baptism. And I, I feel there's people that have not been baptized in Jesus' name that are saved. They're Christians. And, you know, things like that. So we have to be charitable. We have to be um, loving when we come into contact with people who have different convictions. Now, uh, that's not the same as the ones that are teaching that you have to be under what they call under the law, but it's really under the traditions of the rabbis. Now, I had a, one guy when I was in the Church of God, he was one of these Messianic Jews, and he tried to tell me that, that Paul always ate kosher. Well, kosher isn't necessarily Old Testament. Kosher has a lot of things that added to it by the rabbis over the centuries. Uh, a kosher kitchen is not necessarily what you would have found in the Old Testament. But he said, oh, Paul always ate kosher. I said, show me that. Well, he couldn't really show me that, see. And so we have these people that are doing that, that are saying that, well, yeah, uh, we believe in Jesus, but, you know, you have to have all of these things that have grown up over the centuries. And I, I guess I have to draw the line. There's a lot of groups, they go by different names, but they want to put you under uh, rabbinic traditions. And of course, most of them uh, don't even talk about the big one, which is circumcision. They don't even want to talk about that. And that was a huge part of the Old Testament law. Abraham, uh, Circum had Isaac circumcised before the law was given. And if you, if you look at Exodus 4, verse 20, 24 to 26, we've looked at this before. We've got Moses. Verse 24. Okay, Moses had just had a conversation with God, told him to go to Pharaoh and said, uh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Wherefore I say to thee, let my son go that he may serve me. If thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And then verse 24, as he was by the way in the inn, the, the Lord, Yahweh, met him and would have killed him. And Zipporah, his wife, uh, took a sharp knife and cut away the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Thou art indeed a bloody husband to me. And he departed from him. And then she said, O bloody husband, because of the circumcision. Now, 
Moses had a son who was a grown man, and he hadn't circumcised him. So God was going to take him out. That's important. This is an important part of the law. And so mother steps in, takes care of business, and curses her husband. See, poor old Moses, I have to say this, his family was not on board. You know, if you look at his family, his sister, his brother Aaron, his wife, uh, they were not on board very, very solidly. I mean, Aaron, uh, Aaron didn't do so hot <laughs> when Moses was up getting the law. And Miriam, I mean, she criticized him. Remember, she got leprosy and uh, because she, you know, spoke against Moses and I mean, God healed her, but she had to repent. And here's his wife, who's on him, called him a bloody husband. Well, his family wasn't, Moses was pretty much the Lone Ranger in this whole revelation. He got the revelation, the burning bush and the law and everything. And he's trying to get everybody to follow. And it's bad enough the Israelites don't want to go. I mean, they're dragging their feet, and his family is dragging their feet. They're not really, they just don't share that revelation. Ever have that in your family? You've got, you know what God wants you to say and do, and your family just, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, if it ha it'll happen to you, it's happened to me. And, and so, I mean, I got, when I got saved, it got pretty weird. So everybody <laughs> left me. I had trouble getting rid of my old friends. They took off. They, they just, wow. So anyway, here's Moses again. He's, he's pretty much all by himself. Now, can you see why he smote the rock? And, and called them rebels and got angry and upset and wanted to, you know, get the stick out. He's by himself, you know? And so Moses, and again, <laughs> Moses and Paul are very much alike, in case you don't know. They're very much alike. They have similar stories. Paul's the same way. Paul's out there preaching to the Jews and the Gentiles, the Romans and anybody, and they're dragging their feet. He had to go back to the Galatians. The Galatians, that was a church he set up. And he goes back, and here they are. They all want to start eating kosher again and getting circumcised and, and all of these things of the law. And he's saying, how did you get saved? You got saved by faith in my preaching, Christ. Paul was pretty much abandoned, too, by most people, you know. He had people that stayed with him, but, you know, he had a lot of people turn their backs on him. So Paul and Moses are very similar, if you look at them. But as far as the Christian, well... We're not under the law, but I think that we need to understand more about the law than we do. And it's not just something that, you know, was for back then. The law points to Christ. And when we understand the law and the purpose we have a better understanding of what Christ did for us. Because, like I said, when we sin, you know, we don't have to sacrifice an animal on, a, on, a, on an altar. We can't do that. <laughs> we, we would get in trouble for that in most towns. You know, we can't make sacrifices. There's no sacrifices that can be made. It's already been made. And now I understand, you know, the Catholic Church teaches that 
Every time the Mass is said that Jesus is, is sacrificed again, well, I'm sorry, that's just not true, once for all. So you're going to run into these people that worship on Saturday or eat a certain way. Actually, if you ate the way the Old Test they did in the Old Testament, you'd probably be healthier. That's just a side that's just a side comment. You'd probably be better off not eating bottom feeders and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, we have to look beyond some of that because the church is just like Israel. It's been infiltrated for centuries and we just need to be flexible because we're going to run into these people that have these convictions and their convictions. And see, some of the law you can't even obey. I mean, are you a Levite? I'm not a Levite. I don't know. I'm sure I'm not, but they, part of the law was just for them. We already looked at the priesthood and the marriage requirements and, and what they could do and not do and stuff. So part of the law doesn't even apply to them. So you can't follow portions of the law. You know, part of it had to do with the, the land, Israel itself. We don't live there. We live in America. You know, where we live in wherever we live, Germany or England or wherever. So part of the law you can't even obey. So I would say we're not under the law, but we should respect the law. And some of the law is written into man's law, you know, murder and, and theft and, and this kind of thing is already written into man's law. So I wouldn't suggest you go out and murder somebody because you'll go to jail and God will get you too. So, see, some of that's already been written in to the law of man. And so, uh, I guess we're not under the law in the sense that we're not under its penalties. See, we don't, uh, I mean, the penalty for cursing your parents, anybody out there in TV land ever cussed your parents, you'd be stoned. For that first time you wouldn't get second chance you know if you've been involved in witchcraft or anything you'd be stoned see so we should rejoice that those penalties have already been paid Jesus already took the stoning he already took the death for your idolatry or your uh, cursing your parents or your murder, whatever you think you covered up. Uh, Jesus took that punishment. And there were punish there were some things in the Old Testament, the only uh, atonement was your life. For anyone who would like to get saved right now and turn away from your sin, please pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I confess you right now as Lord and Savior. I ask you to come into my heart. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. In addition to our postal address, Anchored in Faith Gospel Church has several electronic means to connect with you. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, Leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 
1-800-242-5322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa. Public access television is not responsible for program content. to 2 Timothy chapter 3, familiar scripture. Everything I'm going to preach on this morning is familiar, but it's going to be powerful. Hallelujah. We are in perilous times. We need to wake up to the fact that things are not going so smoothly. God is trying to wake up a nation. He's trying to bring some revelation to their minds. But they are stiff-necked, just like old Israel. Stubborn people. Ignoring God. Resisting God. I'll tell you one thing about God, though. He don't give up. No, but know this. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Does that not describe our situation? Always worrying about your little wants and your little cares and your little this and your little that. I was reading this morning in 2 Corinthians about how they stood for Christ when they were beaten and when they're beat up. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This nation is overwhelmed with lovers of pressure. We all the time want to titillate the flesh. Amen? What will make me feel good? And they advertise all these pills. The pill companies have got this country convinced that you ought to feel just whoopee-doo every day. If you don't feel whoopee-doo, take a pill. Well, I want to tell you that ain't the way God made us. Sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're sad, and that's the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to have some times when you don't feel whoopee do. But no, they're going to sell you a whoopee pill. And you're going to whoop and you're going to do, huh? Come on now. I don't feel good this morning. I'll give me a pill or a drink or a drug. Something, I'm going to get cheered up. I don't want, well, yet sometimes you ain't supposed to feel good. That's the way we're made. You can't live on a cloud all the time. Sometimes you have to reach down and touch the earth. Or a whoopee drink or a whoopee bottle or a whoopee whoopee something or, or a whoopee down at the girly show or any of those things that might raise your whoopee. Godliness, but denying its power. Marching into them big old church on Sunday morning, putting on a pretty necktie and acting real religious and then just whooping all week on the pill and on the drink and on the... Denying that God has any power. Every time you get a little twinge, going to run to the doctor, amen? Put a little more liver poison. You know all those whoopee pills poison your liver? And then... After they push the whoopee pill and all these pills and, and the anti-pain pill and all this stuff, and then the next thing you know, here come the shyster lawyers on there wanting you to get on a lawsuit to get a bunch of money out of the drug company. Amen? This sermon's supposed to be about the good shepherd. And it, <laughs> this country's completely out of line, completely out of control. How are we going to survive it? Form of godliness, denying its power. From this sort are those who creep into households 
and make captives of grumbling women loaded down with sins led by various lusts. What kind of household do they creep into? The household of faith. Having a form of godliness. I've had hundreds of them come through here. Having a form of godliness, denying the power therein. God bless you all. Fill up a football stadium. If you preach nothing, I've never heard such preachers as I hear that talk for 20 to 30 minutes. And when I get done, I said, What did they say? And they managed to talk all that time when saying nothing. You say nothing because you don't want to offend anyone because you want their money. Unfortunately for me, God has never given me that ability. He gave me an ability to preach, but he never gave me the ability to say nothing. He always gave me the ability to just come through with the truth of God. If they'd used this Bible, it would have changed the whole situation. Amen? Sneaking in, ruin the household of faith, amen? Doing crazy stuff. Still thinking they're Christians. Doing every perverse act you can think of. Getting their own porn site on the internet, my God. I'm talking about people who walked through these doors but ran out when the fire got on them. They hear this, let it land on their own ear. They don't like me anyway. They always want to kill the messenger. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Always learning. These are the people. Oh, they'll come to Bible study and sit there and just like talking to just like talking to a wall. You can be full of the power of the living God, full of his truth, and try and teach them something, and they just shut you off like they turned off their hearing aid. Don't never know nothing. I'm glad that none of you are actually like that in the house today. But you'll listen, learn something. Even if you don't practice it after you learn it, at least you know what's supposed to be, right? Amen? What are we to do? We're surrounded by a world that's going to heck in a handbag. Amen? It should scare you. The world should be scared. Amen? I just need this stick today. The world should be scared. Amen? So what are we to do as Christians? Where are we at? How come I can have such confidence? Go to Psalms, the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm. You guys all love to quote this thing. You can't bury anybody without it. But nobody ever explains the thing. Hallelujah. The Lord Yahweh, Yahshua, Jesus, is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, that's pretty big words. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. That's all right. Now, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they will follow me. Amen? So if you're a sheep, you'll follow him. But Craig goes over there and plays with them goats all the time. Those things won't follow you. There, I heard one. She sounded just like one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know that the, the Arabs over there, the Bedouins and this stuff, know that you never get too many goats in the flock? You know why? The goats scatter the sheep. The sheep, the sheep know his voice, and that word is his voice, and they follow him because their mind is in tune with Yahshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. They are in tune with the living God. But the goats, 
the goats. Want to do it their, their way. You see, the goats have a form of godliness, but deny the power in their end. And they do not follow the shepherd, but they follow every false thing that comes along. They go every direction. What do they follow? Instead of Jesus, the shepherd, and his anointed prescribes under shepherds, the pastors, the apostles, and the prophets, the teachers. They follow men who are goats themselves, who want to gather a large flock of goats for their own purpose. Who will not tell them the truth, but what, but that's what they keep doing. All of them go, but, but they keep butting around. People are like that, like goats. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I hear his voice and I will follow him, but I know what the Bible says, but. I wasn't raised that way. I don't agree with that. Ain't the way my daddy taught me. That's what somebody told me the other day when I was describing the word of God. That ain't the way my daddy taught me. Better go over to the goat feeder. This is the word of God, and I know that it's true. It's infallible, it's perfect, and it says what it says. Now, what you want it to say. There's one person in this place right now that I know that discovered a truth of God, couldn't figure out how to do it God's way, so one did it himself. They hear his voice and they follow him. He don't have trouble with them. He don't have to chase them around. You see how nice this is? He, he don't have to chase them sheep around all the time. They just follow naturally. Amen? They're not distributed across the world by every whim of false doctrine that comes along. They believe the word and they stay with the word. Amen? And they shall not want. Why won't they want? Because they've got the truth. He made me lie down in green pastures. He make you lay down in green pastures. The sheep get to rest. They go to the pretty place. Anybody notice green pastures as you drive around out there now? I mean, every time I look out there, I say, my Lord owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Why should I be in one? He'll take care of me because I'm following him. Amen. He'll make you lay down in green pastures. Nice green pasture. Then the next verse is he restores my soul. Well, most of you ain't got your soul figured out. Your soul, I just hit it. I just thumped it. You'd be far better off at the word in the, in the, in the Hebrew is nephesh. He restores my nephesh. My flesh. Well, the green pastor will restore your soul. He's talking about feeding your belly. He's promising you. He says, don't let, you know, the lilies, the field, and that whole thing. Don't worry about what you're going to. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. He will feed your physical body. He may, you may not get everything. You may not eat T-bone steak every night, but he will, he will take care of you. There's a difference between your wants and your needs. Sometimes you need to sit down and eat nothing but oatmeal for a week just to appreciate something else when it comes along. You're still not in need. You might have to eat them C rations. So you'll appreciate something else when it comes along, Amen. Green pasture, good stuff. Hallelujah. Whew. He's the good shepherd. He 
He lies, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He takes care of your food and your drink. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What's his name? Yeshua, Jesus. Righteousness. How do you attain righteousness? You're not righteous. I, I hate to tell you to have to do this every week, but you're rotten. You're rotten. People go down the street, talk to people, talk to my neighbors, talk to them about the Lord. They'll say, I'm a good person. What does the Bible say? Not one good. No, not one. <coughs> Why? Because we are looking at ourselves at the wrong standard. We're looking at a man's standard. We've got to look at God's standard. And God's standard looks for perfection. But becoming part of the perfect one. When you come into Christ, you become perfect in him. That's your righteousness. Amen? That's your righteousness. Not because you're such a good, I won't dare say Joe, not because you're such a good guy. Amen? Glory to God. For his name's sake, the righteousness is in his name. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I go through hard times. Yea, though I go through trouble. Yea, though I've fallen from the path. Yea, though I have turned aside. Yea, though I don't believe I've turned aside, but I seem to be surrounded by trouble. Anybody ever been surrounded by trouble? Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort you. The rod shall comfort me. Anybody ever had the rod? What's the word rod stand for there? It stands for his discipline. I don't want that. I don't want discipline. Anybody remember the woodshed? Discipline. His discipline will comfort you. Why? Because you walk in his disciplines which are prescribed in that word. You won't have trouble. That book tells you how to live. That discipline tells you how to eat. Brother Doug was talking about healing. There's prescribed things you don't eat. Tell you not to eat this. Don't do that. Don't abuse your body. Amen? Don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's discipline. What happens when you get outside the discipline? You get disciplined. Amen? That's going to comfort you. The rod and his staff. Staff stands for the law. The law of God that is prescribed in that Bible. Jesus summed it all up and loved thy God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy heart, and love thy neighbor as thyself. A staff. It'll comfort you. Most people want to be comforted with a pity party. He wants to comfort you with discipline and get you walk in the right direction. Hallelujah. When you walk the right direction, your troubles fade away. I will fear no evil. I won't fear the, fear the evil one. Why should I fear the evil one? I am in the body of Christ. The power of the living God resides in me. Inside of me, I can cast out devils and step on scorpions and any evil thing that might come my way because I am walking in the discipline of God and his rod and his staff is with me. 
Because I am in him and I'm walking in him. I'm not walking outside the perimeters what he describes. Why don't the church have any power today? Because they decided on their own path. They don't want to take this word the way it's written. They don't want to take God for what he says. They want it soft and easy. <coughs> the Bible talks about people having itching ears, wanting to hear no truth. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's going to take care of you. Why? Because you were in what? The rod and the staff. Amen. My cup runs over. The oil runs out. I am covered with the anointing of God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you didn't have anything else but the 23rd Psalm, and you could rightly divide the word of truth, you could find salvation. Isn't that amazing? There, there's some of these things that people memorize. They memorize stuff. They hear it over and over and over again. But they never get the truth that lies within it. How do you get the mercy how do you get the table? How do you get the green pasture? How do you get all those things? The Lord is my shepherd. Number one, you have to make him your God. You have to become a sheep. But I don't want to be a sheep. I didn't want to be a sheep. I wanted to figure out my own way to salvation. For 20 years, I struggled with God. Thinking I could get there some other way. If I would do this. If I would do that. Amen? If I would do this. That I would do that. There's a lot of different ways to try and get to God through religion. There's only one way to get to be a sheep. That's for the goat to die. to die for your goatish mind to die and put on the mind of Christ <laughs> you see when you're a sheep you don't give the shepherd any trouble you follow him wherever he leads you amen my sheep know my voice, and, and they follow me. Oh, that's so comforting. Amen. I'm going to make sure you're a sheep. He leads me down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. you got to be in his name. you got to be in Jesus need to die to the old and be born to the new represented in your water baptism yea though I walk through the valley of shadow of death I will fear no evil why because he's in you you are with me you get this he's not far off in the heavens he's not down the street at the big church he's in you. That's how you get with him. 
the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God living inside of you. That's how you. When you let the Holy Spirit control you, you don't have a lot of trouble with the rod because he's controlling you, amen? It just, it just comes natural for a sheep to be a sheep. It just comes natural for a goat to be a... Prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup run over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're going to end up in the right place. You're going to end up in the right place. How many really want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Let's see your hands. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Be a sheep. The old adage is give up. Because whatever you think, if it doesn't agree with the word, is wrong. We live in a world where they don't want any absolutes. No absolute truth. Well, without absolute truth, you have no truth at all. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was God. And not anything was made without Him. He made everything by speaking. He made you. And he give you a choice to be a goat or a sheep. Everybody's head bowed and every eye closed. If anybody in the house needs to give up a goatish attitude, accept Christ and get real. Get real with him this morning. I want to see your right hand. I want to see it just fly in the air like a, a rocket. on TV instead of raising your hand you call it 828-4815 that's 828-4815 if this is on the internet you need 319 first 319 828-4815 Lord God I ask you to bless this congregation let us walk in your paths let us understand your word in Jesus name I pray amen For anyone who would like to get saved right now and turn away from your sin, please pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I confess you right now as Lord and Savior. I ask you to come into my heart, and I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. In addition to our postal address, Anchored in Faith Gospel Church has several electronic means to connect with you. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.